this place, this most special place, how did it come to be what it is? This is the story of its beginning. In the year 1878, as part of a famine relief program in West Central India, people were engaged to plant neem trees along the roadsides in Ahmednagar district. Not long after that, a full-gauge railroad line was finished to Ahmednagar from Domed in the south. The British Army, which was occupying India during the 19th century, brought the railway to Ahmednagar to provide quick and practical transportation to the 16th century fort in Ahmednagar, which served as a most suitable facility for their military base. During World War I, a prisoner of war camp near the Ahmednagar fort held a few thousand non-combatant men from the Axis forces. The accommodations were comfortable enough. No one wanted to escape. Late in 1916, a case of plague was confirmed in the city of Ahmednagar. And as per British Army regulatory precautions, the confined men were to be vaccinated against this. However, several hundred of the detainees refused to be vaccinated, so as an alternative, it was decided that they should be quarantined in an isolated place. The search for a suitable place eventually led them to a site just north of the humble village of Arangaon, six miles south of the city. Though Arangaon means village of the forest, most of the trees in the area were harvested by the end of the 19th century for timber and fuel. Directly accessible by road, this site was also adjacent to the railway line. A well was dug in the bank of the river near Arangaon, which provided water to a large double tank that was constructed on the top of a hill to the west of the auxiliary campsite. This tank supplied water by gravity to the camp down the hill, which was situated to the east of the railway line. Within a few months after World War I ended, the POWs were sent back to their respective countries. The POW camp had been used for less than two years. During its operation, a businessman of Ahmednagar who was familiar with the British, Kaikushru Sarosh Irani, supplied firewood, incandescent light bulbs, and other things to the camp. After the camp closed, the leftover supplies and many of the building components were sold at an auction on the site. Kaikushu took part in this auction, but he did not buy the right to the property. However, soon afterward, the man who had purchased the property offered to sell it to Kaikushu. Kaikushu was interested in the property, though his business partner, who was his brother-in-law, also named Kaikushu, saw no value in it, since after the auction there were only four structures still intact the large tank on the hill, a post office building, a bungalow constructed with mud walls that had been a mess hall, and a building for bathing. Besides these four, the structures remaining were in different states of demolishment. There were a few old wells, one just near the camp beside the road. 
but the land with its mostly poor soil remained fallow. Somehow, Kaikushu felt compelled to buy the property. Because of her experiences and associations, Kaikushu's wife Gul was despondent about life. But in the year 1919, she met Upasi Maharaj and his main disciple, Merwan, for the first time. The purpose of her life became clear, though now she had to face more antagonism from their community and family members, who had little or no regard for spiritual masters. Gilori Shah, a somewhat reclusive saint known locally as Maula Baba, was friendly to Kaikushru Gulmai and their family. Born in Baghdad around 1830, he served as a steward on sailing ships as a young man. At some point, he traveled to the mountains of central India and stayed with a spiritual master there for some time. As his fate would have it, he eventually became a butler for the British royal family. Apparently, upon his retirement, he was awarded a good amount of gold as a pension, but somewhere along the return journey to India, he threw this into some body of water. Gilori Shah came to stay in Ahmednagar by the end of the 19th century, and it is not by chance that he chose to associate with Kaikushru Gulmai and their family. They would become instrumental in helping the young Meher Baba establish the place that would become the hub of the major part of his work and activities. Just after Kaikushu had purchased the property leases for the Arangan camp, Gilori Shah asked him for a small plot there saying that he would like to spend the rest of his days at that quiet place. Over the next few years, he occasionally made the same request. Since Gulmai provided him with his daily meals, she put him off by telling him that it would be difficult to send his food such a long distance. However, the real reason they were reluctant to give him what he wanted was that they knew what trouble it would bring them from their orthodox Zoroastrian community and extended family, who did not accept the possibility of spiritually advanced persons. Yet, despite that social pressure, Gulmai had begun spending time at the ashram of Upasni Maharaj in Sakuri. During this period, Merwanji was also often at Sakuri while Upasni Maharaj finished his work of establishing his most special disciple in complete human consciousness, so that he who would soon become known as Meher Baba would be able to feel the world completely and suffer for it every day for the rest of his life. Early in 1921 at Sakori, Meher Baba told Gulmai that her role was to be his spiritual mother. A few months later, Upasi Maharaj told her that Merwan was now her master, that she should serve and obey him, and that from now on she should take his direction concerning all her personal affairs. Indeed, during that time, Upasi Maharaj informed many people that Merwan was now perfect 
and that they should follow him. One night in 1922, Gulmai dreamt that she was holding a baby in her arms wrapped in a blanket. When she uncovered the baby's face, she was surprised to see that it was Gilori Shah who said to her, Mother, I am so tired and you still haven't given me my place to rest. When she awoke and told her husband of the dream, Kaikushu said, this is a definite sign. Now we must give him what he wants. Gulmai replied, Nevertheless, I will speak to Meher Baba about it, and we will abide by whatever he says. The next day, however, Gulmai quietly sent a mason to accompany Gilori Shah to the property near Arangaon, and with some of his devotees, they all came in Tongas. The saint got down, and walking to that spot, with a stick in his hand, he marked the plot that he wanted, declaring that he wanted his tomb to be built here. As the mason was marking the four corners in the ground with mortar, Gilori Shah's followers questioned him about choosing such a desolate, distant place. When some of his wealthy Muslim followers had offered much nicer sites near the city, he replied, You people are like children, you know nothing. One day this place will belong to the whole world. Soon, the Great One will come to stay here. Whenever he walks by, the dust from his feet will settle upon my tomb. Kaikushu and Gulmai had four children. Their sons, Rustam and Adi, were staying in Bombay during this time at Meher Baba's first ashram, Manzil Imim. Under Baba's guidance there, many of the early disciples, or Mandali, began to develop the strict discipline and special understanding required to follow the Master. In February of 1923, Meher Baba's birthday was celebrated there at Manzli Mim. On the following day, the engagement of Kaikushu and Gulmai's eldest son was finalized there. Rustam would marry Freni from another close family of Baba's followers. Afterwards, during conversation with Gulmai, Baba mentioned that he was planning to leave Bombay for some quiet place that would be more suitable for the ashram, where he could ensure that the young men staying with him would have plenty of hard work. She told him about their property near Arangaon, and that for the past four years, Gilori Shah had been asking them for a plot there, where he now wanted his tomb. Without hesitation, Baba told Gulmai to give the saint what he wanted and to make sure that Kaikushru, who was now a concept of Ahmednagar, paid for everything. Upon their return to Ahmednagar, they informed Gilori Shah of the decision. He said, Do it quickly. I want it to be ready when he comes. 
The plan was that Gulmai would bring Baba to the property some day after Rustam and Freni's wedding, which would take place on the 9th of May, 1923. Manzla Imim was closed on April 20th, and Meher Baba came to Ahmednagar with some of his mandali. They stayed at Kushru Quarters, a supply depot compound that Kaikushru had leased from the government. Baba stayed in one room there in seclusion for seven days and then went to Happy Valley with some of the Mondali for about a week. They celebrated Upasthi Maharaja's birthday there that year by feeding the local poor on the 3rd of May. However, Baba was restless to return to Ahmednagar, so they left before midnight, walking the ten miles back to Kushru quarters. Relatives and friends had already been arriving in town for the wedding celebration, and many of them were also staying at Kushru quarters. Though Meher Baba and many of his followers were born into the Zoroastrian faith, that community did not have a spiritual heritage like the Hindus and Muslims. Most Zoroastrians considered Meher Baba and his followers deluded or worse. How could this young man who grew up amongst them be anything special? Yet through the years, by his own direction, Meher Baba and his followers would tolerate the humiliating indignation of the Zoroastrians and religious orthodoxy in general. Baba was already in an irritated mood the next morning because Gulmai had not yet returned from Sakori as he had asked. She had gone there to celebrate Upasthi Maharaja's birthday with some of Baba's other followers. As Adi was helping Baba wash up, he mentioned to Baba that an atmosphere of criticism against him had developed there, instigated mostly by Gulmai's brother and brother-in-law, the other Kaikushru. Baba abruptly walked away, leaving Adi to inform the other Mandali. One of their standing orders at the time was to follow Baba wherever he went, so they immediately dropped whatever they were doing and hurried to catch up. Without explaining anything, he walked west towards the railway station on the end of town. Instead of boarding a train, however, at the station, he turned south and continued leading them another five miles. There was a masonry parapet around the base of this neem tree then, When they arrived there, Baba sat on it, facing east, and pointed out the ready but unoccupied crypt. He commented about the serene atmosphere and the spaciousness, and that it would be a very good place for them. Then, seemingly naive, Baba asked, I wonder who owns this place? Adi replied, Oh, I think my father owns this property. And Baba responded, Good, tell him to give it to me. At that point, the watchman of the property appeared and informed them that indeed the place belonged to Kaikushru Saroshirani of Ahmednagar.
The long walk without breakfast on that summer morning left them hungry and very thirsty, so Baba sent two of the Mandali to the village to bring what they could. Exploring the property, they came to the post office building near the railway tracks first. Meanwhile, in Arangaon, an old carpenter supplied Beramji and Slampson with bakri and a bucket on a rope to draw water from the well. They returned quickly and everyone refreshed themselves. After they had gone back to the post office, Rustam arrived on his motorcycle. He had followed Baba's path by inquiring from people along the way. In an anxious mood, Rustam asked Baba why he left. Baba replied that he did not wish to stay anywhere where they were not wanted. Rustam asked, But then what about your attending the wedding? I've changed my mind, Baba replied coldly. More upset, Rustam protested, I only agreed to getting married because you said you would attend the wedding. Now I'll just call the whole thing off. Baba consoled Rustam, reassuring him that it was his wish that he and Franey be married. Baba explained that it would be better if he and the Mandali did not attend the wedding ceremony. However, Rustam and Franey were to come to him soon after for his blessing. In the meantime, Baba and the Mandali would stay away at the Arangan property. Rustam was told to send the group's baggage from Kushru quarters. Baba and the Mandali spent that first day inspecting the property and making a list of materials they would need to do cleaning and maintenance. They cleaned the large veranda of the post office that afternoon. That evening, the old carpenter from Aragon brought them a simple kerosene lamp. Baba told him, your house will always have light. He would become Baba's first disciple from Arangaon, as well as his first Christian follower. Baba did allow that he and the Mandali would at least be close by for Rustam and Franey's wedding. He came back to Ahmednagar with the Mandali on the 8th of May, staying at Sarosh Manzil, the large new home of Kaikushu and Gulmai. Baba and Gustaji occupied the cupola tower room while the Mandali spread out in the large hall that was the upper floor. Instead of attending the wedding ceremony, however, Baba ordered the Mandali to help in the preparation work for the reception feast. Under Beramji's direction, they washed and cut vegetables for the cooks and served the food, all the while getting the cold, silent treatment from many of the Zoroastrian and European guests. Tasty special vegetarian food had been prepared for the Mandali to enjoy afterwards, but when Baba found that the cooks had carelessly used the utensils for the non-vegetarian food to prepare it, he forbade the Mandali to eat it. Ramju remarked that in the end, they did not feel welcome as guests or servants. <laughs> The atmosphere of hostility against Baba continued behind his back. Gulmai's brother openly accused Baba of trying to usurp their property at Arangan. She would argue that there was no question of usurpment if they wanted him to be there. Of course, Baba came to know of the quarreling and left Sarosh Manzil with the Mandali on the morning of the 11th. They walked to a dharamshala near the station and spent the night there, discussing where they might go next. After all their belongings had been brought from Marabad, 
The next day, Bob had the men pack everything in trunks, which they carried through town to be stored at Kushru quarters until they settled somewhere. Gulmai's heart sunk when she heard that Baba was leaving. After they returned to the Dharmshala, Kaikushu came to speak with Baba. He pleaded, On behalf of my family, I beg your forgiveness for the way you and your people were treated. Please stay and feel free to make use of the property at Arangon. Baba answered, A fakir has no home, and at the same time he has everything. He only stays in one specific place for certain reasons. I do not wish to create differences or divide your family by staying in Arangon. Kaikushu responded, I don't care what others think. I care about Gulmai, and right now she is beside herself with grief over what has happened. Please accept my prayer to remain in Arangon. Baba was touched by concept Kaikushu's appeal and agreed to stay. So the next day, May 13th, they returned to the property, residing at the post office while they cleaned and repaired the mess quarters bungalow. One day soon after that, Baba called Gulmai and her sister Suna and their daughters to the Arangan property. They had Baba's darshan, and then accompanied him to the hill to see the large two-chambered water tank. After they inspected the well-built edifice, Baba told Gulmai, This is the perfect place for my work. Will you give it to me? Gulmai replied, Yes, Baba, it is already yours. Everything is yours. Why do you even have to ask? And he was happy. Baba had told Gulmai that he would take two of her children to stay with him, Adi and Dali, while the other two could live in the world. He told Gulmai's daughter Peroja then that she had to get married. Suna's 13-year-old daughter Korshid began to worry that Baba might also order her to get married. She longed to stay with him. As Baba quickly walked ahead of the others on the path down the hill, Small Korshid ran to catch up and called out to him, Wait, Baba, I have to tell you something. Please wait. Baba stopped and turned and asked, Yes, tell me, what is it? Korshid said, Please, Baba, never give me an order to marry. Please, because I only want to stay with you. Baba replied, It is all right. I know everything. My nazar is on you, so don't worry. You will be safe. I will never tell you to marry. On the 19th of May, several of the older women devoted to Baba came to Merabad to settle the issue of Mera's engagement to be married. Against tradition and convention, Baba disregarded the opinion of all the others and let 16-year-old Mera decide for herself. Though she was shy, she mustered up the courage to say firmly, I don't want to marry. I will never want to marry. Baba said, There, you heard her. Now never bring up the subject again. Though she had been staying in Upasthi Maharaja's ashram, Mara had Baba's darshan for the first time that day at the post office. She would become Baba's closest and most important disciple. At the end of that first short stay at the Arangan property, Baba abruptly decided to travel far north to Quetta with a group of his mandali. But before they left on the 25th of May, Baba named the place. He ordered Nervous, one of his men, to paint a signboard mounted on two posts. It was planted near the railway tracks by the post office and read, Meherabad. <laughs>